We're fast approaching the holiday season, Thanksgiving and Christmas. The music, the movies are already starting. I was at High V this past week, and I heard over the loudspeaker Christmas songs playing. Maybe for some of you, you're like, this is too early. And for some of you, you're like, it could never be early enough. All right, big Christmas fans. I do look forward to the Christmas season every year. Look forward to watching uh, a few Christmas movies that my family enjoys. One of our favorites is Home Alone 2. We watch that every year. And I thought of that this week uh, because a particular scene popped into my head. A scene where the two idiot crooks, which are hilarious, these guys, Harry and Marv, if if you remember these guys, Uh, They sneak into Gimbal's toy chest on Christmas Eve, and they stay there until everybody's gone. You know, it's dark and whatnot, and then they emerge, if you remember the scene. Harry and Marv, they emerge, and with their crowbars, they go after the cash register and the, the, the chest that has all the donations for the children's fund and all that. And it's in that moment that you guys could probably quote the line, but they say something like this. Merry Christmas, Harry. Happy Hanukkah, Marv. You might say, Dustin, why did you think of that? (laughs) And that's a great question. So let me ask you a question. Did you know that Hanukkah was in the Bible? Well, let's look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 22. Here John writes, at that time... The feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter. Interesting to note that the feast of dedication is Hanukkah. So let me just give to you a brief history of this festival or this holiday. In 167 BC, the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes pushed Uh, into the Israelite land and took over the city of Jerusalem. And uh, he was a brutal uh, king. Um, It is said by historians that at that push into Israel, he killed 40,000 Jews and sent another 40,000 Jews away as slaves. In the process, this guy who was infatuated with Greek culture and Greek mythology outlawed any form of religion, worshiping Yahweh in the land. He outlawed the Sabbath, the keeping of the Sabbath. But his most offensive act was to desecrate the temple. Um, Historians say that Antiochus Epiphanes went directly into the temple, into the holiest place, and sacrificed a pig on the altar. He went then and sprinkled a broth that was made from that pig's blood all over the temple and just brazenly desecrated it. It's a horrific moment for the Jewish people. It's a dark period in their history, but there were a group of Jews that refused to go down quietly, and they rallied together under the leadership of the Maccabean family. And then ultimately, three years later, under the headship of Judah Maccabee, or Judas Maccabeus, they moved back in and defeated Antiochus Epiphanes and pushed the Syrians back out. And the first thing they did when they won their freedom, as it were, was to rededicate and reconsecrate the temple. And so that's why you have here in John chapter 10 this feast of dedication. It's about the rededication or reconsecration of the temple. And as the legend goes, when they did that, when they rededicated this, uh, the temple, they only found one flask of oil to light the menorah. And as the legend goes... They lighted the menorah, and God caused that oil to last for eight days. It was only enough for one night, but it also lasted for eight nights. And that's why the Jewish menorah for the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, has nine candles, four on each side and one in the middle, with which they would light the other eight. So, although it's not a biblically prescribed festival or holiday. It's recognized here by John in John 10, 22. This is the context of our text, that at this time, John writes, 
the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. Now, right here, I just want to have a a little family chat with you. I'm going to do a little bit of an aside, and I'm going to actually just read what I wrote for you because I don't want to take too long on this. I don't want to turn it into a soapbox, but I do think it's an, an appropriate moment, a helpful moment for us to take an aside and talk about something that I think could be important for some of you. By, by the way, this is not directed at anyone, okay? I don't, I don't know of anyone. I'm, I'm going to talk about something. I don't, so it's not directed at anyone here, all right? Say that. Okay, let me just read this, and then we'll move on. I want to say that it's evident here that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. He celebrated this feast of dedication. He's present in Jerusalem for the celebration, and perhaps you might say, well, Dustin, it doesn't directly or technically say that he celebrated Hanukkah. I would say, I'll I'll grant you that, but we assume that that's happening when he's in Jerusalem for any other feast, that he's there as a Jewish man to celebrate the Jewish holidays. So Jesus, at least at minimum, you might say, is cool with the celebration of Hanukkah. He's certainly not, not there to speak against it. Now, here's where I want to read. Why is all of that important? Well, I want to say that there are people each year that parachute into churches and families saying things like, Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas. It's not in the Bible. And it actually has pagan roots. It's a pagan holiday. We should not participate in that. Now, I will grant you that it's not mandated. Christmas is not mandated in the Bible. But it makes sense why we should celebrate it, right? To celebrate the birth of Christ. Moreover, if you want to, I would say you can find pagan roots for anything. Pretty much pagan roots for anything you ever do. So be careful if you just Wikipedia stuff. You're like, oh, we shouldn't eat our meals at noon. Pagans do that. That wasn't in my script, sorry. Um, this, is, this is why I had to do this. All right. So if you think Christmas has become too commercialized, there's probably truth to that. And you don't want to celebrate it. If, if you're going like it's too commercialized, it's not really about Jesus anymore, I don't want to celebrate it, that's cool. The point is that you're free to celebrate it or not celebrate it. But here's what I want to say. Please do not cause division and turn people away from Jesus by acting like those who do celebrate the birth of Jesus and enjoy sharing love through gifts are somehow sinful or less than. Okay? Can we make a deal there? Let's be kind towards one another, um, humble towards one another, And if you come across something like this, be humble about it, all right? You're free to celebrate or not celebrate. Does that make sense? You guys with me? By the way, let me me just say this. Uh, Okay, maybe I'm not going to say that. Okay, maybe I will say it. All right. I know that there's probably more scenarios than this, so... If there are in your mind, send your emails to Matt McGrew at Gmail. <laughs> <clears throat> um, could I just say this? Which, which of these two hypothetical scenarios would be more compelling with regard to reaching out to people? Which of these two hypotheticals? Let's say your, your neighbor is over the fence singing, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Option one. No, it's not pagan holiday. Don't invite me to your Christmas celebration. Don't bring any gifts. Don't want it. I'm a Christian. Or second hypothetical. It's the most wonderful time. You know, I love Christmas too, man. Can I just tell you why I love Christmas so much? Because we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, the Son of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Which of the two is more compelling? I would argue the latter. All right. Aside over. Family chat over. Back to, the, back to the text. This is the context, the feast of dedication or the celebration of Hanukkah, or it's also called the Festival of Lights. Here they are celebrating God's work to deliver them 
from that Syrian madman, and they're also celebrating the reconsecration of the temple, that it might once again be a place in which people can meet with their God, come and commune with God in his presence as God determined to allow his presence to be manifested there. So they're celebrating, think about this, as we work through this text, they're here celebrating in Jerusalem the deliverance from desecration, from the desecration that Antiochus Epiphanes brought. So remember those words, deliverance from desecration, as we continue to read. John notes for us in verse 22 also that it was winter. Perhaps this is just a a nod to the fact that the feast of dedication was celebrated in the middle of December, according to our calendar, every uh, year, winter time. But perhaps also John is giving to us a poetic um, nod towards the chilliness that's in the air with regard to Jesus. Verse 23, And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews, verse 24, gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, we got to be careful as we read that because our anticipation might be that these guys are asking this question with hope in their hearts, with anticipation in their hearts. Maybe he is. Maybe Jesus really is the Messiah. And if so, could he just clear up a few things for us? But let me just tell you, if you are with Jesus at this time, if you're one of his followers and you hear these guys ask that question, your eyes would roll for a couple of reasons. First of all, because he's already answered this question. He's already answered that question time and time again. But moreover, because you know, you know that these guys don't really want an answer. These guys are looking for any excuse that they can find to kill him and push him out. These guys are not sincere at all. They are willfully blind. They don't want to know the truth. And so be careful as you read that to understand the tone. Jesus, are you really the Christ? If so, just say it plain. What are they saying? Really, they're just looking for a reason to kill him. Nevertheless, Jesus was kind to answer. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, I've already told you, I've already made it plain, and you do not believe. But then he goes on to say this, really important for our understanding of this entire text. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. I've already told you, verse 25, I've already told you and you don't believe, but the works that I do in my Father's name also bear witness. They give a clear testimony. So Jesus is highlighting here the hard evidence that's in front of them. Everyone can talk a big game, but only the Messiah can actually do. Only the Messiah can actually fulfill what's been prophesied about him. And Jesus is saying, look at the works. Look at the evidence. If you will, I think you could summarize this entire text with this phrase. My works, Jesus is saying, my works bear witness that I am the Christ sent from the Father. I am the Christ sent from the Father. Now, I just said, and this is big, this is the point of the entire text. Let me prove that to you. Watch your text, verse 25, and see, by the way, as we walk through this, see the connection between his emphasis on works, his works, and the Father. Verse 25, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Verse 32, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Verse 37, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So four distinct times in this little discourse, Jesus says, look at the works, look at the works, examine the evidence and understand that it connects me, it tethers me to the Father. 
So to their question, are you the Messiah? If so, say it plain. He says, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. And I call the Father as witness through the works. The Father is now called as witness through his works. Now, you might have the question, Dustin, how are Jesus' works uniquely tethered to the Father? How are Jesus' works linked, as it were, to God the Father? I would say a couple of ways. First of all, let's just think about it in terms of the quality of Christ's work. Christ's works have been supernatural in multiple ways. First of all, supernatural in the sense that Jesus expresses or demonstrates authority over nature, authority over creation. He can reverse it. He can do whatever he wants to with it. Think about that in terms of the works like turning water to wine, right? Turns water to wine. He casts out demons. Think about what he did at the woman at the, with the woman at the well. Even in his word to her and then through her, he sets off an entire revival amongst the Samaritans. He heals the nobleman's son. He heals the lame man. He feeds 5,000 people with one boy's lunch. He calms the storm with a word. He walks on water. In chapter 9, we've just seen him heal the man who's been blind from birth. And he's not done. By the way, he's not done. You could argue that the best is yet to come. He's about to raise someone from the dead, and then he's going to be raised as well. Jesus is saying, look at the works. Examine the works. All the evidence is right in front of you. The supernatural quality of Jesus' works. You you can see it there as he demonstrates authority over nature, but you can also see a supernatural quality in the sense that he is fulfilling in many of these works, fulfilling direct messianic prophecy. That the Old Testament is saying, this is what the Messiah will be like. This is what the Messiah will do. And in his works, he demonstrates fulfillment of that. Think about the quality of his works. But then on top of that, think about the quantity of his works. It's overwhelming, right? I mean, the breadth of his resume is great. So you're not anchoring your soul. If you're a Christian, you're not anchoring your soul to a person who was in the right place at the right time and did a heroic thing. No, this is the breadth of his works as he talks about works in the plural. Look at the works. Look at all that I've done in front of you. Just examine it. Any one of these, if you talk about water to wine, walking on water, stuff like that, healing a man who's been blind from birth, any one of those is enough to go, he's different. Perhaps this is the Messiah. But when you start piling them up, what you realize is the evidence is clear. The evidence is clear. It's overwhelming. So he hasn't, to their question, my friends understand he hasn't been unclear at all. And so that's why he can say to them, look, I told you. You're the Messiah, make it, make it plain. I already told you. Moreover, I've already shown you. The evidence is conclusive. Now, this is so beautiful. This is why, for those that are willing to see, this is why Nicodemus, one of these Pharisees, said this in John 3, 1 and 2. You guys remember what he said? This is so good. In John 3, 1 and 2, this noted Pharisee, right? Noted teacher of the law. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Isn't that good? This is one Pharisee is going like, okay, I'm grappling with the evidence. I'm wrestling with the evidence. It looks pretty clear. So the verdict should be unanimous. Jesus' works bear witness. Amen? His works bear witness. So the question is, why don't these guys see it? 
Why don't these guys see it? If it's so plain, if it's so obvious, if it's so clear, why are they not convinced? And the answer to that question is twofold. First of all, because they don't want to see. The reason why they haven't seen it yet is because they are willfully blind. Their mind is already made up. It's already made up. Someone well said, doubt looks for answers, unbelief looks for excuses. Now, these guys aren't struggling with doubt. Like, Jesus, I'm, I'm with you. I want to see this. Just can you clear up a few things for me? There are things that I don't understand. That, that, this is not their mentality. This is not how they ask this question. That's why I'm emphasizing the tone of it. The, these guys are merely looking for excuses. Unbelief looks for a reason not to believe, a reason to push Jesus and the message of the gospel aside. And by the way, there's an inherent warning here for you an inherent warning here for all of us. It's possible for us to deceive ourselves, to be, to have our mind already made up, to not be willing to examine the evidence. Don't don't be that way. They, They don't see because they don't want to see. But on top of that, you could derive that from context. This is what Jesus has been saying to them over and over again. You guys are willfully blind. What does the text say? Verse 26. Jesus tells tells us why they don't believe. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Why don't you believe? Why don't they believe? They don't believe because they're not a part of his fold. They're not one of his sheep. Thus, they don't hear his voice. Verse 27, my sheep, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. Those that are a part of his fold, they hear his voice. But those that aren't, they reject. They don't hear. But let's, let's press into this a little further. All right? it's, I don't think it's just as simple here. I don't think his argument is just simply that they don't have spiritual eyes to see. What is, what is Jesus saying when he says, you are not my sheep? In order to understand this, I think we've got to continue to read because here's the deal. Please, please grab this, my friends. Understand that when Jesus says, you don't believe because you're not a part of my sheep, they would have said, what? Think about it. They would have said, of course we're not. They would not have been offended by that. Of course we're not a part of your sheep. We don't want to be, right? They would have been offended the other way. If he would would have said, like, you're a part of my group, my disciples, they'd have been like, no, we're not. They they would not have been offended by him saying, you are not part of my sheep. You're not one of my sheep. So what is Jesus doing? Continue to read, okay? Track with this. Verse 28, I give my sheep, he says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus is saying that the ultimate outcome for those who are my sheep, those who do hear my voice, is salvation. They will know an eternal security with me. But there's more. Verse 29, here's where he gets really to the point of why he says, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So verse 30, I and the Father are one. But what's going on here? Jesus is outright telling these guys, you're lost. You're lost. In in what sense? In this sense, they thought of themselves as right with God and entitled to decide about Jesus. But what Jesus is doing in this moment is saying, look, if you're not decided about me, you're not right with him. Because my sheep are his sheep, and his sheep are mine. If you don't follow me, what Jesus is saying is, as he confronts these guys, if you don't follow me, you're not right with Yahweh. Because I am one. I am am of one essence with 
the Father. Two persons, one essence. Jesus here is unmistakably claiming to be God. Am I the Messiah? I am. I've told you already. I'll tell you again. I am. Look at the works. The works demonstrate that I am and understand I am one with the Father. I'm the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And they get it. They understand what he's saying in this moment because they pick up stones. Check out your text, verse 31. They pick up stones and they're ready to hurl them at Jesus. They understand exactly what he's saying. He's claiming to be God. He's doubling down. So they pick up stones again, verse 31, to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Pause right here. All right, sometimes we, we lose our imagination when we read the Bible. Don't, don't lose it here. Can you imagine this scene? This is not going like these Pharisees and Jews, this is not going like they hoped it would go, <laughs> okay? Not at all. But it's just fascinating to watch as Jesus interacts with them and, and makes his point very clear, abundantly clear. When he says, I and the Father are one, you guys are not right with the Father because you're not following me. You're not hearing my voice. They pick up stones to stone him. Can you imagine that? I mean, these guys are outraged. Just see their faces, if you could, in your mind's eye. These guys are outraged. They're furious. And so they're, they're searching around and they're grabbing boulders, little boulders and stones, whatever they can find, because they're ready to hurl them at Jesus. Perhaps they brought their bag of rocks. I don't know. But they're mad and they pick up their stones and their arms are like cocked and ready. Can you imagine the intensity, the ferocity of the scene? As they encroach upon Jesus' space and it's just getting tighter and tighter, they're ready to take him out. And what does Jesus do? My friends, just grab this. Jesus is so awesome. He's so awesome. In that moment, with that kind of intensity, Jesus goes, um, seriously, just think about it. They've got stones and they're cocked and ready and they're, they're getting tighter and they're about to kill him. And he says, um, okay. <laughs> With his word, he just calms the scene. I mean, there's, just, there's so many evidences throughout the narrative about Jesus that just demonstrates his authority. He's always in control. Always in control. He says to them, okay, so you're going to stone me. Okay. So which, which one of the works, which one of the good works that I've done am I getting stoned for? That's what he says. Look at your text. Which one? Am I getting stoned for? And it's almost like they, they start to calm themselves a little bit. And they say, oh, it's not for a good work. It's not for a good work that we're about to stone you. It's for blasphemy. You claim to be God. And then Jesus does something really interesting. Jesus says, you know, essentially, funny, funny you should mention that. It's interesting when you think about your Bible, when your own law. Look at your text. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Verse 33, Jesus answered them, It is not good for a, work, for a good work. Oh, I am so sorry. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work. We've already, we've already said this, but let's read it. It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Then Jesus does this. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, by the way, what a statement there about the authority of scripture. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? What in the world is Jesus doing? It's unique. It's kind of odd, right? Well, in order to grab what he's doing here, please turn with me to Psalm 82. I don't often have you turn elsewhere, but I want you to turn here at this time, if you would. 
so you can see the clear context of Jesus' quote. Here in Psalm 82, the, the quote that Jesus lifts is Psalm 82, 6. But see the context for a moment, the Psalm of Asaph. In verse 1, it says, God has taken his place, the God, the eternal God, has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the lowercase g, gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? What's happening here? The context of Jesus' quote of Psalm 82 is God's indictment of these human judges. His indictment of these guys that were a kind of God, a kind of Elohim. What does he mean by that? What the scripture means by that in this moment is that these guys who are human judges to discern cases amongst God's people are a kind of representative authority. They represent the authority of God as judges. Thus, verse 6, I said, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So God is very clearly in this passage indicting these human representatives, but Jesus' quotation here is about these guys being a kind of God, a kind of representative for him. He does the same thing, by the way, with regard to Moses. See these texts on the screen, Exodus chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. God here says, I will be, to Moses, I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, that's a reference to Aaron, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him, as a kind of mediator, a kind of representative for God for Aaron. Now note with me Exodus 7, 1 and 2. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. See, I have made you like God, as a kind of representative of God or for God to Aaron and then to Pharaoh. So, what's the point? Why does Jesus do this? in John chapter 10. So go back with me to John chapter 10 if you haven't already. Why does Jesus do this? What Jesus is saying to these Pharisees is this. If judges, in your Bible, if judges can be called a kind of God, not the God, but a kind of God, and if Moses can be called a kind of God, then certainly the Messiah. Jesus' point is is to say, from lesser to greater, like, it's obvious you should be looking for the Messiah to be called a kind of God, a representative for God. Like, this shouldn't be a problem for you. Now, you've got to be careful here for a moment. You have to understand exactly what Jesus is doing. He's not lessening his point about himself being God, right? He's not denigrating that at all, reducing his claim. He's not saying that he is just like those judges or just like Moses. I think what he's primarily doing here is dismissing one of their lame excuses. He's employing their own rhetoric to dismiss one of their lame excuses, basically to redirect the focus to where it, where it belongs in this moment. Where does the focus belong? The focus belongs on the proof that Jesus has laid out about the works that he's done, the works that tether him to the Father. So I think what Jesus is doing here in this moment is is to say, enough with the excuses, enough with the games, right? Look at the works. Examine the evidence. The point is that I am the Messiah, and you have to discern, do the evidence bear that out? 
Is the proof there? Is the evidence there? This is exactly what Jesus does in this text. Look at verse 37. If I am not doing, note the next phrase, the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. So this is a redirect to say, look at the works. Look at the evidence. It's all right there in front of you, guys. See it. Believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So how do they respond? My friends, how do they respond? Well, they respond in two ways. The first is there in verse 39. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. They sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Jesus here inviting their investigation. In essence to say, you have to evaluate whether or not my works testify that the Father has vested in me the authority as the chosen Messiah. I'm either the Messiah or not. What do, what do the facts say? What, what does the evidence say? And these guys don't even look. Do you see that, verse 39? They don't even look. They don't search out the evidence. They don't, they don't care to see, my friends. They don't care to see. They don't want to see. So one group exists in willful unbelief, and they seek to destroy him. They want to stone him, and then they want to arrest him. They won't have anything to do with him. And I think it's interesting that this is all happening during the Feast of Dedication, during the Feast of Lights, during Hanukkah. So I asked you to remember that. Here they are celebrating their deliverance from the desecration that Antiochus Epiphanes brought to Israel and to the temple. Yet ironically, in this moment, what do they do? Track with this. Ironically, in this moment, what do they do? They seek to stone and arrest their ultimate deliverer. Their ultimate deliverer. So these Jews underneath the leadership of Judas Maccabeus won their freedom from the evil Antiochus Epiphanes. And yet here, they're looking into the face of the one who came to deal with our ultimate enemy, Satan himself. And yet what did they seek to do? They seek to get him out. I can say it this way. During a feast in which they celebrate deliverance from desecration, here they are, seeking to desecrate the deliverer, seeking to put an end to their ultimate deliverer. But that's not the only response. Praise the Lord. Check out your text, verse 40. So he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign. Now think about that phrase in terms of Jesus' emphasis, his repeated emphasis on his works, tethering to the Father. They said, John did no sign. John the Baptist did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Isn't this great? Those who are willing to look, those who are willing to examine the evidence, they see it plainly. They see it clearly. So, my friends, the sheep hear the voice. His sheep hear his voice. They follow him. And Jesus gives them eternal life. What a blessing this is. So, so John the Baptist, who did no sign, pointed to the one who did. And they say, he's done it. More than enough. 
more than enough for us to trust in him, to believe. They see it and they believe. And by the way, isn't it great that the word many is there? Many people, many people come to him there and believe. All right, as we conclude this morning, let me just give to you three observations briefly, three observations from this text. First of all, I just want to encourage you, my friends, be encouraged by the clarity of the Christ. Be encouraged by the clarity of the Christ. The evidence is clear. As I said a moment ago, you're not basing your eternal soul on some guy who was uniquely wise or some man who was in the right place at the right time and was heroic, was courageous. No, we are trusting our souls to God who became man and demonstrated that he was the Messiah in a myriad of ways. Amen? What a blessing this is. His resume is rich, it's deep, it's wide, it's long. Jesus is trustworthy in every way. So be encouraged this morning by the clarity of the Christ. He invites investigation. Search it out, and you'll find that the evidence is overwhelming. Number two, be amazed by the pursuing grace of Christ. Be amazed, secondly, by the pursuing grace of Christ. Would you look back with me briefly at verses 37 and 38? So remarkable to think about the fact that here Jesus is talking to these guys who have many, in many moments, already picked up stones. They have encroached upon him to seek to arrest him. They, they can't stand Jesus. They won't evaluate his claims. They're willfully blind. They hate him. They want to see him ruined. And yet, in the face of that, what does Jesus do? In answering their question and in making his claim, he also gives an invitation If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, know the next phrase, that you may know, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. What an invitation. What a blessing this is to see the heart of Christ, even in this moment where they have just been around him with stones in their hands, he says, you can know. You can know. I'm inviting you to investigate. You can know. And again, it's good to be reminded that in the book of Acts, we find that many of them did come to their senses. God turned the light on, as it were. They saw. They were willing to look, and they saw. But praise the Lord for his grace. Amen? There's always hope. As you think about family members, friends, coworkers, neighbors, perhaps you've been praying for and seeking to share with for a long time, don't give up. Don't give up. There is always hope. Jesus constantly extends that invitation. Be amazed by the pursuing grace of Christ. And then thirdly, be secure in your Father's arms. Be secure in your Father's arms, this Father who freely bestows eternal life, salvation upon those who trust in His Son. So, as you think about John 10, 27 and 28, perhaps you will want to glance down at those verses again. As you think about that text, aren't you glad that your security in Christ isn't dependent upon the strength of your grip. My friends, aren't you glad that your security in God is not dependent upon the strength of your grip? What what does he say there? Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my hands. He's holding on to you. Great spot for an amen. He's holding on to you. It's not about you holding on to him. If, if God has brought you to this place of repentance and faith whereby you understood, I, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I can't save myself. There's nothing I could do to move the needle. Nothing. But God came for me. God came here and lived perfectly. 
I, I am not perfect. I'm so far from it. But he was perfect for me and then went to the cross. Though he did not deserve it. I deserved punishment, but he took the punishment for me. He laid his life down so that he could give life to me. That's remarkable. If God's brought you to that place of repentance and faith, whereby you understood and you trusted in Christ alone, you're secure. His arms are around you. Amen? Now, even as I wrote to you yesterday, this context is interesting. Jesus says these words to these guys who don't believe. These guys who are looking for an excuse to kill him. So how does that impact our understanding? How does that impact our interpretation of this? I want to say to you, it enhances it. It enhances it in a beautiful way for as you followed, as you tracked with me through that text, and again, feel free to look down at it. But as you tracked with me through that text, we found that Jesus was tethering ultimately into the Father to help these guys understand that if they're not with him, if they're not with Christ as the Messiah, they're not with the Father, for he and the Father are one. As we understand that link, think about how beautiful that is with regard to your security. For in that text, Jesus says, I'm holding on to you. No one, no one will snatch you out of my hands. But then he goes on to say, and no one will snatch you out of my Father's hands. Isn't this great? If we can cheat a little bit and advance forward in John's gospel, Jesus will add another chord, the Holy Spirit that Christ in this triune God, the Father and the Spirit are all as one but three holding on to you. What a blessing that is to think about the Trinity, the triune God. Jesus says, I'm holding on to you. My Father's holding on to you. My Spirit is holding on to you. What does that say to you? You're secure. Amen? Amen? You're secure. That threefold cord will not be severed. That threefold cord will not be broken. So, when our kids were younger, especially when they were younger, there were moments in which they would get scared, perhaps at night, or get injured in some way and come running to mom and dad. And some of those moments were more acute than others, more difficult than others, and required a little bit, a little bit more comfort, a little bit more consoling. And so I remember moments in which Catherine and I just kind of passed them back and forth. It was like I was holding on to one of my children and squeezing them and wanting to make sure that they felt my arms around them. I've got you. Dad's got you. You're good going to be okay, and then pass to Catherine, Catherine, her arms around, I've got you, Mom, mom's here, Nothing, nothing's going to happen to you, then pass back to dad, and it's, <laughs> we're good, you're going to be okay, this illustration pales in comparison, but understand that Jesus is saying, I'm holding on to you, nothing can take you out of my hands, the Father is holding on to you. The Spirit of God is holding on to you. If you're in Christ, my friend, if you're in Christ, you're in the Father, you're in the Spirit, the Spirit is in you, you're secure. Amen? You are secure. What a blessing this is. What a Savior we have. Amen? What a Savior. It's remarkable. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for this text in which you in, invite investigation and you freely, you freely offer that your works are clear. They're clear to, stay that, to state that you are the Messiah and that the Father is in you. We thank you, God. I pray for those in this room this morning, 
I pray that if there are people here that don't yet know you as Savior, I pray that you would draw them to yourself this morning. I pray that if there are those in this room this morning that are struggling, 